Hi everyone, we're gonna get started. So today we're gonna cover tools to build a world in a single day. Uh, I gotta be clear right from the start, all the tools today I didn't make in the single day. <laughs> the worlds we're gonna make, make a world in a single day. Um, so before we get too deep, who am I? I'm Thomas Tobin, the lead technical artist at Rainbow Studios. We're a motocross game, we work on pretty large worlds. Uh, I've worked on companies such as Ubisoft, I was previously at Unity, uh, I've worked on worlds from 400 kilometers down to a space about 25 feet of playable space. Uh, and pretty much the entire time I've been on procedural tooling, how do you either work with a very large art team or how do you work with a crazy small art team? Uh, and so all of the tools today will cover the entire pipeline, they work for both. Um, hope you enjoy. The software used today, obviously, Houdini and Houdini Engine. Um, we're gonna go into the Houdini side of it, but the end goal is all of these tools are HDAs. They're made for Houdini Engine, an artist would work with them, you'd expose a few parameters and you can work with any of the tools. The next is OSM and Mapbox. If you're not familiar, OSM and Mapbox paired together is basically like the Google Maps of open source data. Uh, with Mapbox, you get the height fields. With OSM, you get the roads and buildings. Uh, we're gonna show how, one, you can just load it in, but then how do you use it in so many different ways than just making a digital twin, a one-to-one? -one. Uh, and finally, we cover just very basic substance sampler of just processing textures. The core problem pretty much at every single company I've worked at is we wanna rapid prototype worlds. Tools can't be made for single purpose. They can't be made for single art style. Because if Houdini tools, for example, you're investing a lot of upfront time. So you have to be sure that one, it's reusable. One, that you're actually gonna share the purpose with, if you're moving on, you're moving on to a different production. For me, I, a lot of it is I'll do consulting work. Can I go with any of my clients? Can I sit down with my art director and use those same tools with him to generate worlds insanely fast? So the first world we're gonna construct is, it's in Rokinha. Uh, it's a favela. Uh, me and my previous coworker, we made this world from scratch in two hours. The next, uh, this is for a game I'm making on the weekends. This was made in 10 minutes. And uh, to be clear, I bought those art assets too um, for the second image. And then the third one, again, we're gonna be diving deep into this one from scratch fully. Uh, this was about four to five hours with two people. So when I approach any type of tooling, this is pretty much the very high level workflow. I wanna spend a ton of time upfront doing conception and research. Of course, when you're at a AAA company, you're not the one concepting, but you wanna understand in your concept art, what is important to one, the concept artist, two, to the art director, and three, to the gameplay team. These are important pillars when you look at concept uh, because you wanna be able to draw out from the concept art figure out, do I have a tool existing that fits that purpose? Do I need to remake a tool? The next stage is, we have a concept, great. I understand what you want. I'm gonna block out a world in a minute or two. Is this roughly the world size you want? Is this the scale? Is this the shape, the form, the silhouette? From there, we'll use some AI asset generation to generate buildings, just to fill out the train. Again, seeing, is this the initial feeling that you wanted? And for an art director, this is a super important back and forth process of iteration. The entire time, focus on iteration. The third is scattering. You have assets. You, we've generated them either through AI or you've bought them or you have an asset bank. You wanna place them in the world, obviously, and you want them to feel organic. So the first stage is just scatter them, make sure it works. And the next, actually figure out how to make this a real life world. How do you make a player walk through it? These are all just steps for setting silhouettes, setting scale, setting shape. And we'll cover what I mean by silhouetting through this entire talk. And the fourth one is world refining. So this is just your polish patch. How do you add life to a world that you've just generated? So let's look at four AI concept arts, for example, for the desert world. When I'm looking at them, again, point of iteration, point of speed, these were generated in five seconds in mid-journey. Uh, it's a Discord tool for art generation. Um, we look at repeated assets. So in each one of them, they have foliage, they have rocks being scattered. We have really interesting silhouettes in the distance. So that's our edge of world terrain, for example. We have interesting buildings within most of these. So I'm kind of identifying one repeatable elements. I'm understanding 
where do I want visual interest? How am I actually attracting a player to the scene? And we're going to try and make, for example, tools that help that process. So the very high level, where I start and how these tools pass their info down. Terrains, again, I'm biased, I work on a racing game, so terrains are king in my world. But I think terrains should be the core focus. I mean, it's what players walk around, they explore these areas. So you want your terrains to then pass all their info down. You want a beautiful terrain, we've created that. The next is biomes and waypoints. You want some type of tagging within your terrains to say, this is a desert biome, this is a winter biome, and you tag your assets, for example, just scattering them in those regions. A biome doesn't necessarily have to be what you traditionally think of a biome. It can be a city, it can be a village. It's just how you're classifying your assets at this stage without placing them. The next is city layout, roads, and pathways. They're all very connected, but it's filling out an area, a village, a town, or an entire city with buildings you've generated. How do you make it have a road network that doesn't collide with it and pathways that connect these buildings together? For me, the next step is buildings, interiors, and AI pathing. Now, these kind of go hand in hand because for buildings and interiors, I almost never generate interiors because, again, I want to sit down with my art director. I have an hour with him. I don't have time to figure out the interiors. Does this all make sense with you? We're just looking at from a distance, does this make sense? So we'll generate buildings, we'll generate the layouts, do the doors make sense? So that he can walk through the city and it will make sense, but we're not going too far into each of these tools. And AI pathing, a lot of this is just automatically handled by all the curved systems above. So the road networks are able to pass it to the AI network, for example, in our games, and they're able to follow the same curves. The final is prop placement and foliage. It doesn't matter really at any stage when you place these, but you never want them colliding. You don't want to spawn a tree inside of a building. So approach how I take that process. Looking at this image really quickly, silhouetting past one. It's all about shape, form. We can see it's a city. There's nothing else to it. So we go to Google, for example, if you don't have concept art, and we look up beautiful environments. You'll see they all share really interesting silhouettes. The top left image, for example, the mountainside, has this really sweeping distant silhouette. The one right below it, again, you have this huge triangle pointed mountain. And on the second row, second image is the waterfall. This is really interesting because it plays with negative silhouettes, for example. So we have these two large blocking sections and then we have a hole at the center of a negative silhouette. And that for world building, for example, it signifies where a player might want to go. So we want a tool that approaches something like this. If you can create a tool that just very basically blocks out some type of silhouette, you can relatively get these shapes, these forms. Even the same tool, which we're going to break down in a much more detailed version later, it's the first step of manual generation of an environment. The second is Mapbox. Uh, Mapbox, again, is a node in Houdini. It will load in the OSM data and height fields uh, with some satellite footage. So if you're trying to recreate a world one-to-one, -one, type in your coordinates, press reload, and the entire map generates. The second approach is Mapbox on steroids. There's a link to it. It's someone's gum road. Uh, it's pretty much the Mapbox nodes, but it loads in really, it zooms in to the, each quadrant and will automatically render uh, a much higher resolution version of the height fields. Uh, if you're working with one-to-one -one data, something like this is essential because if you're capturing a large area of terrain in the original Mapbox node, you're not going to get any of the resolution there. And again, you get the buildings, you get the road networks. So if you're trying to create a world and you just want relatively what existed, thank you for coming to my talk, we're over. But of course, that's not the point of today. We want to make a new world. So we move on. We've generated a world somewhere. We start with silhouetting past two. You have the form of the human in the front. There's no texture, there's no shape, but the silhouette, you immediately know that's someone, right? We have shapes of rocks, very basic foliage. We have the distant setting of the buildings again, really interesting edge of world uh, shapes that we're creating. And, and you have very basic form of visual effects, for the example, the birds flying over the city. So let's make tools that help that process. On the left, we have a really low poly. This is loaded directly from uh, the Mapbox node. If you run it through something like erosion pass, immediately you can fake the up res. 
we don't care if it's a one-to-one. -one. We're creating new digital worlds. So if you're adding detail, you just want to blur it out. So let's approach that process together for the desert world. We go to Egypt, and I want a desert, right? So I just zoomed somewhere randomly in the desert because I know it's going to be sandy. It's going to have these rolling hills. So in the Mapbox node, we've grabbed, it's actually a salt uh, mine as well. So it has these really interesting blue areas down below. And we load it into engine. I don't know about any of you, but that doesn't really look like a desert to me. So we try and add layers to it. Can we save this in any way? You add just a yellow color. Because again, the whole point is selling the vision as fast as possible with whoever your director is uh, or your client. And so yellow, again, we're signifying sand. It's just inherent. We don't have to have a texture on it. Still doesn't really look like a desert. So then we add dust, we add a little bit of lighting, we add some interesting volumetric clouds in the distance. And I'm thinking, is this my desert that I think in my mind? Not really. So it's suffering from a really interesting composition problem, if we look at it. When you think of desert, and we go through these different images, they're all suffering from this exact same problem. Other than being incredibly boring to look at, they have no interesting edge of world silhouette. They don't have any type of shape to desert. There's nothing setting the scale. So we go back to our image. Again, flat horizon line. So we try and see, go back to your reference. What's real life look like? When you search flat desert on Google, there's almost no images of a flat desert. There's maybe one or two in the entire Google search of the top like 50 hits. They all have some type of edge of world or mountains or silhouette. I mean, we have the bottom left, not even the top left, it still has little mountains. It's almost totally unnatural to have nothing in the distance, right? It's the whole point. If you're going to take a picture, you want some type of visual interest as well. So we go and search desert. Desert alone is starting to, that's when I think of desert. I think of these crispy peaks. I think of really interesting sweeping lines. And again, the softness of it all. So my first initial process is let's just make a tool. We copy, we draw a line, and we copy random shapes along the line. When you skin it in Houdini, and then you randomize at each point which shape's being placed, we're starting to make a shape generator, a silhouette generator, just for the distance. When you pass it through something like a height field and you run it through erosion, and you convert it to a mesh, in 15 seconds, four nodes in Houdini, we've got an island generator. Again, for the weekend game that I'm working on, this was perfect. I just needed something that generated little shapes that a player could walk within. But again, put it in engine. See, is this what you want? Get that done as fast as possible. That doesn't look like a desert to me. That doesn't sell the exact vision. It's just random shapes. So we go back to our reference and we say, what does desert sand peaks look like? I'm focusing into the detail I want. I want those really crispy edges, but then the soft sweeping lines. And each one of these, they remind me almost like an ice cream tub that scooped out large sections. When I think of that, I think of whirly cellular F1 noise. The only reason I think of that is because you want to spend the time, you want to experiment. We're going to go into noises today. I've spent the past two or three years just on the weekends learning noises and figuring out how can you use them in so many different ways because they're so powerful for empowering your environments. So the first pass is we take our whirly cellular F1 noise, that's hard to say, and we pass a mask over it. So the mask is the red lines. The red lines signify we're going to apply some type of filter to it, some type of next step. If it's red, it's applying. If it's white, nothing's happening. And we apply it just to the top half of the mesh. And this is just to break apart the super linear uh, pattern noise. And we swirl those lines into it. And I'm just breaking the edges, so we're keeping the crispiness of the sweeping desert. But again, you're making it more natural. You're feeling, making it feel like real life without the work of doing an actual wind simulation, for example. And the next step for me was, let's dive into surface noise. Can I add some type of visual interest? And I spent a few hours on this, uh, just coming up with lots of different noises. How do I make it feel like little sand grains have sweeped down the terrain? And you get it in engine at the end of that. And I realized you can't see any of that surface detail. You just wasted all that time. So that's a huge step for an artist. If you're not getting it in engine at every step of the process, you're not seeing what your end result is, you've already failed because that entire time is wasted and you're focusing on iteration. And we're going to rabbit hole. We're going to put a building, for example. We're going to put 
1.8 Thomas units. I don't actually care about scale. We're at silhouetting past two. We're just setting, these are roughly a building, this is roughly a human uh, in the world. And you'll see, we can't see over our rolling hills. There's no visual interest in our scene. There's nothing to the scene. We can't see our rolling desert anymore. So we do a hack that's often done in games. You have your big desert around you. We choose a playable space, for example. I think this is a kilometer by a kilometer. And this would be where you would lock the player to. We raise that space 400 feet up in the sky because I want that beautiful vista. I want to see the sweeping curves, but I also want the player to experience that. So we raise it up and then we zoom in. We apply a really heavy slumping. There's a height field slump node, for example. If you do 50, 60 iterations of those initial OSM data, you start to get something that looks like the clumping of sand, the softness. And again, if you push it even further, say in a for loop, and you slump way more than you should and you add lattice distortion, you start to get the clumping of sand. It's grabbing where the areas have eroded out and swept out. And we want to add some type of surface noise. But again, I was trying to fix the problem of I couldn't see anything. So I've just made sand noise. I wasted all that time when I'm, you have to stay on the core problem. Figure out what you really want out of the tool first, and you're estimating. So we dive into it. I'm still adding detail at this stage. So I thought, I want some type of wind. I could do a full wind simulation and actually simulate wind at 400 kilometers per hour and see how it erodes through the train. Or you can cheat it. We have a single day. So we copy, using the Highfield pattern node, these little triangles, and it's just a repeated pattern over the train. And just mask out the flat areas of our mesh. And when you add a really high lattice noise uh, and swirling it with a swirl pattern, you can swirl it almost like the wind, naturally. And with the, a very low amplitude, you can just influence the bottom of your terrain. But remember, we're fixing a problem that was not our original problem. So we go back to it, and I thought, I want to see this terrain below me. We've raised it up in the sky, but we're still not going to see over our initial rolling hills. So my first thought was, I'm going to rotate the landscape at a five degree incline. So everything's downhill. A player will never really know because they're never leaving that landscape, but they're always going to have a beautiful vista. And that's the whole point of selling a vision of a world. So if you use the height field transform node and you rotate it and connect it to a mask by feature node, would say a 20 degree angle. When you use the rotate Y function, it rotates the height field, but it's not really rotating anything. It's rotating the representation of the height field in space, but the height field's not actually updating. So you want your angles, you want to stay within height fields if you're working with a rotation. So I needed to come up with some way that we could angle height fields. So if we take a height field pattern node, and instead of those little tiny triangles, we do one massive triangle in the world and you mix that into your original height field, all of a sudden, because you're blending your height fields together, you're taking a ramp that's setting your angle and you're mixing into your original height field, the height field mask by feature node actually picks up that masking now. You're properly rotating your landscapes. And we get it back in engine. So immediately, we have that surface detail because we're using Nanite. This is actually a crazy high poly mesh, so we were able to encapsulate um, the curves in the sand. And we're always looking downhill, so we always have a beautiful vista. We see everything around you. Nothing's ever going to be blocked because it's all below you. And I go down the thing of to tool or not to tool a lot. A huge pitfall for me is I will make something without doing the research. That's a huge problem personally. So if we want to scatter buildings in this space, I want to start placing a city. Uh, on games, I've often you have an artist or a level designer. You want a very simple tool for them. So if you expose a curve tool, say the image in the very bottom right there, they just draw a random shape. And when you use the mask by object node, you import that back into your height field, you can mask out the red space. So we're going to place buildings in that space, for example. At this stage, we've loaded in wherever we got our art assets from. We randomly place them with the space. And if you set it a big enough radius, the radius of your building, they're not going to collide with each other, as you see in the bottom left. We're going to increase that to 5,000, and it's only going to fit as many houses as they don't collide. But we want to add detail. We want to add life to it. So then I go and I think, well, I need foliage around this, and I don't want to place it. So if you take the low poly version of your buildings, so it's 
relatively more efficient, and you remove that from your initial, initial mask, now we're never going to spawn something within those buildings. And we place another Heightfield scatter node, for example. So the green cubes represent some type of foliage. They're, none of them are ever going to spawn within a, another object. But if you want to do this over and over, you have so many assets that you don't want to collide within each other, it becomes a Russian nesting doll problem of you're checking so many layers up, and this is not an efficient process on a large game. So you have to remember the R in R&D. Before you start tool development, always look, does this thing exist already? And sure enough, if we're working on foliage, use the Unreal Foliage tool. Use whatever tool exists for you. You don't need to make it from scratch every time. If you're making one world, in a single second, we could paint out all the foliage that we wanted. If we're making lots of worlds, that's when you maybe want to start investing your time. So we've created from scratch with Houdini this relatively pretty desert vista. But we've just tailored our tools to one world. We want to make a lot more worlds, for example. So the same world, the same tool, we're going to create from three different OSM maps and mix them together and make two different art style worlds using the exact same tool set. So when we approach OSM data, again, when we load in certain regions in the world, uh, or height field and map box, it's really low resolution. We have the grid lines passing over it. Because I'm not making digital twin, I don't care if it's one-to-one -one with the real life. You blur out any detail using a box blur, for example. This is keeping our original silhouette. We're not over-blurring that we've lost our shape, our form. But now we can add our own unique detail to it. So we pass over something like a height field noise. Um, so this is going to be a very high frequency, low amplitude noise. And that adds some type of visual interest to it. It starts to look like a real environment without the erosion pass. Because the erosion takes a long time. Uh, and then we go into terracing. Terracing is just about masking out a region. You don't really want to apply terracing everywhere. Otherwise, it just looks like a big stepping environment. And I want buildings to be placed in the scene. Because it's very steep, I want to mask out where people have cut into the train, cut into the world. Uh, and build their buildings. So I'm just randomly masking out regions and flattening them and adding stepping. So that when I add my erosion pass, I'll have relatively flat areas that I know are going to be good enough to place a landscape within. So in, I think it's eight nodes, we've created our environment, we've up really low resolution geometry. This is not a complex tool at all. But I'm not stuck with one world. We're just figuring out, is this the vision you wanted? So you want to start making variations. If you start from low resolution and you up res it, that's one way of approaching the problem. But now let's look at noises that enhance your data, adds new types of forms and shapes. So again, you sit with your art director and you say, we can start with your form, is this what you originally thought? Or I can give you a bunch of different variations and you can choose from them. See what you like, what you don't like. So imagine a piece of napkin. If we grab the two corners and we use uh, the distort by layer node, you can pinch the terrain and it will clump up regions and add this really interesting ripple effect. It's the same V valley that we started from, but it's a fully new environment uh, that feels completely different. We take that same V valley, we mix it into that same giant triangle um, angle pattern, and all of a sudden, if you're working on something like a Lord of the Rings shot, if you're traversing the edge of the mountain, this would have been perfect for it. We could cut in a really interesting scene and the camera just passes along. This doesn't exist in the world, but it's based off of the silhouette that you started of. So as I was building out these noises, I didn't know how to make noises. I didn't know what types of noises I need. So you want to be OK with being silly. There's no right way to do any of this. So we're going to copy random shapes to the bottom half of the mesh. And I created a unique, it was the height field erode node. But instead of gravity working just pulling objects down, I coded gravity work as a sinusoidal wave. And so it pulses the gravity value. So as the hydro erosion passes, it pulls the rain back up the terrain. So if we're working on something like an alien world somewhere, all of a sudden, if the gravity was pulsing in and out for some reason, you're going to have these really weird patterns. And that's a real factor. And this is really what it would look like because I'm fully simulating it. So again, just having fun, I'm seeing what works. What shapes do I want? And I can sit down with my art director, and I can show these all these different types of erosions. So we'll cover very briefly what type of essential noises I think are fundamental for, say, a AAA production. The first is some type of high-frequency, low-amplitude noise. We copy this over the terrain. 
and we just add some type of detail to that low resolution. The next is rough sands. So I mask out the bottom. And this was a really interesting noise to create for me because it's the same type of high frequency noise, but it's a repeated line pattern across the train. So rough sand is pretty much, it acts as like almost like pebbles and rocks and it clumps together in these ridges. And so when you apply it to just the bottoms of these terrains, you get the roughness. And so for a motocross game, this is perfect type of noise. The next noise was soft sand. Soft sand, again, we covered it before, it's that really heavy slumping. And it's interesting because it's the complete inverse of really high frequency, low amplitude noise. You want it to be as soft as possible. You're sweeping away your forms, but still kind of keeping your shape. And if you're adding the bottom swirling sand layers that look like wind has passed over it, it's really, again, you're just working with a triangle mesh and distorting it like a snake slithered through your world. The next noise is striations. So this was a really fun noise for me to create. It took a long time to figure out how to do it, but it's the same type of high frequency noise. And instead of just doing a top-down noise frame, we're applying it at a 30 degree angle across the entire mesh. So you're cutting into your terrain, this really noisy, and so we're adding those lines that cut into it. Imagine a really rocky cliff face that's gonna have big rock chunks falling. But that's just gonna apply to the steep parts of the mountains. You're not gonna have striation to the whole mesh. But those rocks in real life, as they've fallen, they've landed on the train below. So you wanna have some type of second pass. So in this case, I figure out how much material is being removed. And I drop random little cubes at the top of the train. And I actually do a full simulation of dragging them down the cliff and see where they land up. You project that back into the train and all of a sudden you have these interesting boulder shapes because they've literally rolled down the hill back in your terrain. Now, the game I'm working on is a low poly game. It's a stylized open world Zelda light. So if you just lower the resolution, you're not gonna get where you want it to go. It doesn't really look that great. But if you convert it to mesh and use something like the labs tool is the mesh sharpen node, and then you go back to height field, now you're starting to work within a stylized world. You have those really interesting blocky shapes, but we followed the exact same realistic production pipeline, and it's a single node. I was sitting in the shower at one point, and I thought, I can just take an island from anywhere. Can you mix islands? Can we come up with new shapes? So if you load in, I think these are two islands off of Greece, if I remember correctly. The left image is their map box data. They're really low resolution. So we pass it through one of your noises of choice. Say a high frequency, low amplitude. Starts to feel like a real island, starts to look real. Then we overlay them like Photoshop layers and you start to blend together these OSM maps. So we can create whole new island generators off of real life places. The next I thought, well, we have roads. How do we approach the road problem? If we can just generate a map anywhere, you want it to be navigatable. The first approach is always manual. Um, almost always you'll have a level designer and they're able to tweak your curves. So the core par part of it is if you have a tool, they draw the curve and it's gonna sweep some type of mesh along it. Uh, for example, this is a railroad. But we have Mapbox roads. I don't wanna have to draw out my entire road network. I want real life road design that feels humanized without the effort of actually figuring that all out. So we go back to OSM and we load in the road network. Now, in Rokinha, uh, this specific region, it's really densely packed, but because of the OSM data, it doesn't have those roads. They're just not captured in the data set. So I wanna add back in that really densely packed city. It's got loads of tiny little offshoot roads, and again, that density. So I grew up in Hong Kong. Um, these are a few different neighborhoods. It's Wan Chai, and then also in Singapore, and I think it's uh, some other random city I stole. If you take their road networks, you can inspire your own design off of real life cities. If you're able to do that, you can kind of say, what type of feeling, what type of history do you want to recreate? Choose different places around the world and then comp them together. As long as they never intersect, you don't have to fix the problem of roads that don't work. Uh, you can blend the two connections, but then those inherit little chunks, they're real life cities. They're really designed like that. You don't have to figure out the really complex road generation patterns, and you can make a whole new world out of five, 10, 15 different cities 
And it's going to feel real because it is real. It's somewhere in the world. And we go back to Rokinha. On the left, we have our original roads. And we comp together, we just overlay it onto the train and merge our road systems. Make sure it's not intersecting with existing roads. And we add the clusters of Wan Chai in Hong Kong. It's so dense in that neighborhood that we're able to add back into our data set that density. Again, get it an engine. I'm automatically masking it to my terrain data to just generate my pathing. So I can start to feel out, is this the scale? Is the tightness of the roads? I'm going to fill out the in-betweens after. So the filling out, let's go into buildings. First step, your quick R&D. I want to see what exists and what type of production pipeline you want to do. So the first is, if you want to go full procedural, in a single day, if you're making worlds, you don't have time for this, to be honest. Um, you can use an existing tool, but then you're having to figure out modules. You're trying to figure out a lot of different problems. When, if you're selling silhouette, you're setting scale, you're setting shape in these places, I approach it step number two. Can we lay out a city? Can we just have like a UV packing tool? Can we automatically take buildings that already exist? So let's break it down the entire building generation before we get too overwhelmed. The first is, we need buildings. Where do they come from? Are you buying them? Are you building them? The next is, how are you laying out these assets? Do they make sense? Do they feel like humanized design? You go into the door problem. For example, if you just spawn random buildings, we're going to cover it later on, the doors are always close to the road. So you have to think, if I'm randomly automatically placing a door, you have to then check and move that door so it's actually Again, humanized design. If you have doors open up into a building, it's going to look automatically generated and it doesn't look great. And you'll get the uncanny valley feeling. And the final is props and road interaction. How do these all layer into the system? But you don't have to go complex with it. We're still at silhouetting past two. We're just setting form and shape. And does the city feel real? So the first step is building generation. How do I generate buildings in 10 minutes? I'll go on mid journey and I'll generate facades. Um, basically, you type in uh, 2D plane facades of whatever architecture you want in the world, and you'll get a trim sheet of a lot of different buildings fronts. So if we have a sci-fi city, we have uh, Greek architecture in the bottom left, so on. You pass that into a tool like Substance Sampler, for example, and that will just automatically generate, say, your depth map. It's going to add a little bit of detail to it, and it's going to add the normals, the spec, the lighting. You're going to add real material lighting. So it's going to feel a little more real once you get it in an engine. Next is, if I can start from some type of building shape, I can automatically mask out in the mid-journey material, mid-journey texture, where the buildings are, and then copy them to the UV coordinates on, again, my blocked out buildings. And if you project it onto OSM data, for example, we take their real life buildings, their low poly, you're not going to walk through the city and think this is real. But from a distance, this is going to be your billboards. It's going to feel like your city. If you're starting to go towards how do we do this up close and personal, you might want to approach it in something like a semi-procedural tool. If you have an art team, they can make out modules. And you just build them a very simple tool that stacks these modules, randomly assembles them, and builds you out actual real meshes that look fairly decent. Or you buy them. If you have our team, you already have existing assets, that's great. So we take our building layout. That's our next step. We've just made low poly buildings that we can fill out a scene with. I'm going to load them into just a brute force approach. I'm going to scatter these just using the high field scatter node, no collision, and see does this feel like the density, the, the appearance of the city that I want. Again, you're trying to create, is this exactly what I was going for, as fast as possible. For me, this was selling the feeling of a really condensed city. But again, you can't walk through it. They're all, the, all the buildings are intersecting here. So that's a problem we have to fix. If we go at about, about uh, the approach of we now spawning buildings and you don't want anything to intersect and you want it to make sense, I always approach this problem with UV packing. So UVs basically take a negative space or some type of shape, and we force shapes into it. They're 2D shapes. Uh, and so we're just packing as efficiently as possible with some random rotation into that negative bounds of the roads. 
the little lines off of the buildings, they indicate doorways. UVs don't know about doors. So I'm just randomly choosing a door location and saying, does it fit in that space? If you generate your interiors, now you have to think about, do the actual doors make sense? Is there space for it? What type of shop it is? We don't have time for that. But you can approach the door problem in a very basic way. You can place four doors, for example, on every face of the building. And then you can rank every single ray cast. So you can cast from your doorway and check a meter in front of you and say, is there something colliding with it? And give it a score, say from zero to one. If there is a building in front of it, rank it really low. If there's no building, give it something close to one. Then you check, is it close to the road? And you measure the distance um, from that door. So eventually you're going to find, this is probably the real life humanized design door because people want to open up the door and they're on the road. They don't want to open up in the back of their building. When you parse through it, you just check every single face and choose which one was the best one. And you can flip and choose proper door locations. Another way simplified approach of this is, imagine shapes. You draw out a triangle, a special triangle, and a circle. I know their locations of these buildings. I know where the doors are going to be because I've manually drawn the shape and I've chosen the asset location. If you connect it to your biome system, for example, the random cell coloring uh, in the right-hand side here, if I just choose their rotation and comp them and make sure, again, they're never intersecting, the building design is going to feel exactly how I wanted. It's going to be the layout I wanted because I drew it manually and just scattered them throughout the terrain. But you wouldn't download a city. I don't have time. I don't want to figure out all of these problems. I can just borrow a city from somewhere in the world. So we go back to Rokinha. These are the buildings that exist through the Mapbox node again. If we just look at the buildings, you dive into the top down, for example, you can extract their centroid. You can figure out their orientation. You can know at each point here how large is the building taking up on that space. No buildings in real life intersect, so none of these points are ever going to intersect when you copy your own art assets onto them, if they're relatively the same scale. So we copy on our stylized buildings. We can put on a million buildings if there's a million points in real life. Again, if they're the same size, the same scale, everything in here will feel like humanized design because you're copying it off of real life. But you're not stuck with the one-to-one. -one. If you connect it to something like a seed, so you have 100% and you have no buildings, and you drag that slider back and forth, you can say, I want 10% of the buildings and randomize that. So all of a sudden you have a bunch of different city variations from one city in the world. No buildings will ever collide because they didn't collide in real life. But shouldn't ever build these tools for one purpose. Trees don't collide in real life. They don't intersect, except the leaves. Um, so I loaded in Hong Kong. You would never know. You don't look at this image and you think, that looks like a building layout. Once you get enough assets, enough filling, you can use these tools for anything that doesn't collide with each other. But you have to think about scale at every stage here. If we took Hong Kong's buildings and we put them on the Rokinha terrain, the house in the bottom right, that's a fifth size of the entire mountain. That's a giant house. Because in real life, that was probably a huge sky rise. So you have to account for either are you going to fit within the sky rise and you can pack in your own houses uh, that don't collide or you can overlay your data and make sure as you're masking, you're blending these two types, you know the world scale and you know what type of assets you're filling in. You match that scale and you apply your buildings back in accounting for all of these factors and you can start to fill out a world. So this is seven different cities in the same space. And it makes sense. It's realistic sizing to what these places actually are. And it's the density and the feeling that I was going for when I started the scene. But we want those original Rokinha roads. The road system is really interesting because it swirls down the mountainside. Again, I don't want to have to figure that out manually. If I can figure out how real life does it, I'm going to borrow that. So we take our original buildings and we mask out the train. If we subtract the roads from it, then we can ensure that if we place a building back where it can go, it's never going to collide with the existing road networks. So we have six cities, the original node network of the original building, and a relatively enhanced version of the train. Get it an engine. It's starting to feel how I want it to look. It's starting to get towards the density. So 
I just want to fill out all of the negative space in this world. Of course, foliage. Foliage for me, sure you could do it the building swap approach. I don't care for foliage if it's really, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. So you take that original mask, you subtract the buildings, you subtract the roads, you choose an angle, for example, that's flat enough that a tree could actually grow on. It's never going to grow on, say, an 80 degree incline. Um, and you fill out all that rest of the space. So when you load in your foliage network, your trees, back into the system, all those trees, they'll always fill out. It will always make sense because it's following your humanized road design. It's following your humanized house layouts. And trees just grow randomly. So we get in an engine. Again, this entire scene, 10, 15 minutes. I can just choose five different cities, comp that in. I can choose the original location, drag my assets in. And we're starting to get a world that feels like a little stylized world that I'm going to work with. So we move on to silhouetting pass three. Pass three is about those final details. We have the right lighting reflection. We have small little rocks placed along the center of the scene. Again, we have those interesting silhouettes. So you want some type of curve tooling. This can be anything that you copy along a spline. Whether these splines are drawn manually or automatically, it doesn't really matter. But you want some type of generalized curve tools, of course. So again, for the game I'm working on the weekend, everything in the scene was placed automatically in a single second, actually, when I loaded up the exact region. All of it is almost powered by splines, automatically placed. So if I load in my terrain and you simulate your erosion pass, that blue geometry in the scene is going to place a little lake mesh. For you. And as that lake collides with the terrain, that intersection is going to generate me a curve. That curve now places all of the rocks around it. So I can hide the really weird mesh intersection here. I can kind of hide away my blending. The trees, they're the buildings that were in those real life places. The rocks in the distance, again, that's the real life terrain from this area. The visual effects is a spline that's taken the lake and inserted itself. It checks, am I close to a tree? Could I actually place a little tree uh, leaf in the water? You want tools that are all adaptive and all connected. So with the same tool set, you load in Rokinha with some type of realistic buildings. Again, with my previous coworker, this was, I can't remember, two hours or so. Um, we generate super realistic worlds because we can just base them off of real life. Then you can fill out your proper art assets. You can actually flesh out these worlds. How do you layer all of these tools together? And if you build spline tooling, you build your automatically scattering tools, you place your buildings, and then now you have vertical space you can pack into. So on the rooftops, we have space that we can automatically copy props on. We can copy our trees within the space, the foliage that's growing up off of the buildings. Those buildings generate their own splines that can grow ivy. So you want to connect all of these systems together. And in games, you have to remember we cheat everything. The entire world that we created from the desert, it's 400 feet in the sky. The player's never going to leave that space. They don't know. All they ever saw was that beautiful vista, that beautiful area. And so if you grab anything from today, I want the three main takeaways to be push it too far. Dial the entire thing back later. Once you kind of flesh out the world, the tech artist in me is going to kill me saying this, but place way too many objects. Place 40 million buildings. Place 40 million trees. Does that feel like you want it to? I'll figure out the optimization pipeline later. Again, in the same day, all these worlds had to run on an iPad Pro. If we're placing 20 million trees, 20 million buildings, you do realistically have to have an end goal. But my art director, my current team, said something really inspiring to me. He was like, if you never push it too far, then as I show him the image, he's maybe not a thought of everything, right? So I can show him 100 variations, a lot of different trains, a lot of things. If I scatter a building right on the edge of a cliff, that's not what he originally asked for. But it was just one of my versions that's inspiring him. It's adding detail. It's no extra effort for me. You're adding again. How do I show it? As far as possible, maybe you'll gain something from this. It's not costing that much until the optimization step where you'll spend months. But don't be afraid to make mistakes. I didn't learn how to make these tools overnight. They took me 
two to three years at least. And again, you're working a lot of different production pipelines. So you're learning, how am I currently working? What do I need to do to get to where I want it to go? So I look at the concept art and I say, I have this tool already, but I want that tree tool. I want the silhouetting tools. I don't know how to get there. Spend a couple of hours, sit down and just prototype. Throw nodes together in Houdini and figure out what works for you, what doesn't work. Do some research, see how other studios do it. No one's gonna judge you for learning. And again, in a production sense, all of your time should be spent on iterating through the entire pipeline. You wanna sit down with any member of your team and say, is this what you thought? Is this where we wanna go with this world? If it's a no, I don't want that link back to the start of the pipeline to be crazy time consuming. Uh, on most productions I've worked on, it'll be procedural up to a certain point. I think full procedural never works because you have to commit, you have times, you have scope, you have budgeting. But if we can focus on pre-production, on production, on iteration, and I can constantly iterate, if I regenerate a new terrain and all my tools are mapped like they're connected, it will generate the roads for me, it will replace the buildings. That iteration step, it's not really much more effort when you're building and designing these tools. You just have to think about it. You have to add it to your tool set. Thank you so much for attending today's talk. The attribution is Mapbox and OSM and a few learning materials. I hope you enjoyed. And time for questions. And that's the link to this PowerPoint if you ever want. Cool. Any questions? Go for it. You have to attribute to it. Okay. Yeah. And that's the only open source requirement. And if you are staying as a digital twin and you're enhancing the OSM data one to one, uh, you have to uh, contribute in some way to OSM, I believe. It's the second requirement. Any other questions? <laughs> Cool. I think that concludes this talk. I'll be outside if there's any other questions, but thank you. <laughs>